in the United States, whatever politicians' rhetoric are, the right controls the discourse. We are in a period, historically, when the crisis of capitalism, which is endemic to the entire capitalist world, has not benefited primarily the left. I will exempt parts of Latin America, because you know about that. And perhaps it's true of Greece as well, although that's still early. The military is still waiting in the barracks. Force is really what matters there. Despite that, the, the loss of the spirit of capitalism has largely benefited the right wing. And there are several major reasons for it. On our side, and I don't mean our side in the narrow sense, but the broad sense of the left, we have to face the music. We are forces of protest and resistance sometimes. The best example recently was Occupy and Madison, Wisconsin. But we are not a movement of ideas. We don't have an alternative to capitalism that makes sense to people. We couldn't even describe among ourselves what we really meant by the new society in any coherent way. We just say socialist, communist, anarchist, but we don't really have a serious conversation. And what's even more important is that in the national debate in this country, the left has disappeared. It doesn't matter. So that a David Axelrod, who is Obama's key figure, said in the prelude to the 2012 presidential election, don't worry about the labor movement, don't worry about the left, they're not a problem. Hmm. What happened? Because we don't have any alternative. Sure. And one of the reasons we don't have an alternative is because we don't have a unified political formation of the left. Yes. And I'm not using the word party, although I can have that conversation with you as well. We don't have a, a unified political formation that speaks on every issue that comes before the population. Yes. We don't have a unified political formation that has a series of alternatives to propose to the rotten system that most people have to live with. Where 50% of Americans, for example, people who live in America, do not even have their heads above water. They're struggling. And what do we say? Nothing. If we have anything to say personally, that's one thing, but we, as a movement, we say nothing. 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 Say nothing, do nothing. So I'm going to make a, a, a modest proposal. Modest because it is going to bring us back to the 1860s and the first international. I'll tell you what that proposal is. In the 1860s, 50s and 60s, when Marx and Bakunin, an anarchist, and Proudhon, a guild socialist, were in the same outfit, they did not make a membership distinction between anarchism, socialism, and communism. They had a party which had always divisions, always divisions, but never said to themselves that they were going to make their divisions on the basis of ideological differences. They were going to be in the same organization. We have to create a new kind of organization that is not the Communist Party, not the Socialist Party, and not the Anarchist Federations, but all of the above together. Yes, 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 yes. Like this guy. We have to create an organization that learns, that, that, that does what Amy Goodman does, and I watch her every night that I'm around at 6.30. <laughs> <clears throat> which is that she brings people together to discuss the issues of the day. We have to discuss the issues of the day on a national level and then make real statements 
organize around those issues. We have an innocent man sitting in Pennsylvania, Momia. I know he's innocent. And the reason I know he's innocent is because my girlfriend knows he's innocent. But she said, no, but she, but she says he will not tell who did it because he won't snitch. He's sacrificing his life rather than selling out. Yes. When Cornell West says, we have to learn something about force and violence. We have to learn a lot about force and violence. If we, are, if we don't have our own forces, and I'm not gonna spell it out now, this is the wrong time to do it. If we don't have our own forces, don't have our own political formation, do not have our own national newspaper. You know, I'm not, one of the things that in my biography nobody talks about is that I wrote a column for the Guardian of the United States for two solid years. I wrote 30 columns a year. I wrote 60 columns, some of which have been incorporated in my books. The Guardian was the national spokesperson for the movement of the 1960s yeah. and early 70s. It died 20 years ago. We don't have a national newspaper, mm. both hard copy and online. The Brecht Forum just went down the drain. Sure did, sure did. I teach at the Brecht Forum and I have 30 students who are talking about revolutionary politics in a non-revolutionary era. And they come every week and Michael Pelias teaches there and um, Peter Bratzis teaches there and there are other people who teach there. We don't have that on a national basis. We don't have schools. You think you're going to get schooling in a public institution or private institution in Harvard, Princeton? Did Cornell West learn politics from Princeton? Oh yeah, show him. Oh yeah, I, that, that, that's true. But he didn't. But he was. But he was. He was in the Panthers. He, he never told you that. <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> that's where you learn. What now? When I was a boy Stalinist, <laughs> I was a boy Stalinist. I went to the Jefferson School of Social Sciences. I learned about the pre-Socratics and Aristotle and Plato, that they were bad people, not the pre-Socratics. <laughs> I learned Barclay, Hume, and Locke. I read Hegel, mm -hmm. I read Marx. Hmm. I'm not saying that they were that their propaganda was correct. What I'm saying is they exposed me, a 16-year-old kid, to all that stuff. We have to find high school students. We have to find college students. We have to find working class people. And the thing was, when I worked in the factory, when I worked as a metal worker, I worked in a steel mill. We had a study group. And we then took over the local union. <laughs> And when I went to work for the Oil Chemical and Atomic Workers, I met a guy named Tony Mazaki who did the same thing in his plan in Helena Rubenstein in Long Island. And he became the Secretary Treasurer of the Oil Chemical and Atomic Workers Union. You've got to have organization, otherwise we die. And we're almost dead. I'm gonna stop pretty soon, but the one thing I wanna say is that I have a book coming out in October. It's called Dead Unions and the Live Labor Movement. The, labor, the, the, the union establishment in the United States is dead. Dead. I don't believe it can be resolved and can be revived from the top. When Cornell says we've got to start from the bottom, that's the answer. We have to create a trade union educational league as was existed in the 1920s when there was no union movement worthy of the name because we have to begin to organize among the rank and file. But we can't do that unless we have young people and people who have the dedication to be willing to do the organizing. That's true. And in order to do that, we have to have an organization. And I think the one thing that we also have to say is that one of the things that I learned from the Panthers, although they didn't invent it, was that if you have 80% of black people 
left behind by affirmative action and no child left behind and all that, and living in conditions of, of hardship and unemployment, and kids that are hungry, and Latino children in Los Angeles as well, in the Southeast. It is the job of the left to go into the communities and feed people. For the American Red Cross and the city government and the city of New York under that wonderful leftist, uh, Michael Bloomberg, <laughs> had failed. So that the problem that we face, and I'm, here's my last word, the problem we face is the building of communities, the building of horizontal communities mm. as well as mm. communities with mm. voice yeah. is not mm. going to happen because we have exercised mm. our reliance on the state. Caring communities. Man. When I grew up, mm. I was I did never thought the cops were my friends. <laughs> Although I got you know I got used to my father in law. <laughs> <laughs> But we have to have our own community That's true. Yeah. that makes demands on the state, That's right. but also calls attention to the fact that this system is not only rotten, but has to be replaced. And what we mean by replacement, we have to learn how to spell out. Unless and until we do that, we're going to continue to have a nice annual conference. You, you should know this, by the way. The left forum, its headquarters is in my office. <laughs> but that's an organizational question. It's not located in some office building on Wall Street. It's in my office. <laughs> and the volunteers come to this office, room 6115 at the Graduate Center. So that my center has become the host for the left forum because we have to have organization and we raise money. That's another thing, finally, finally. Funding, yeah. The left doesn't like money. It has an aversion to money. Except for themselves. So we go to foundations if we want uh, cash. Or we go where we get grants. One of the things I learned in the labor movement is that you raise your money from your members. Nice. You True. don't depend on the rich. Otherwise, they take over. That's right. Don't kid yourself. The foundations, the liberal ones, as well as the conservative ones, are really not interested in ideas and they're not interested in fundamental social change. The only group that will be interested in social change will be our political formation. Awesome.